when you look at the political spectrum, we on the conservative at one side and the NDP at the other, we're quite different. But that's okay, Madam Speaker. That's the beauty of our parliamentary democracy here in this place. So, Madam Speaker, why are we gathered here and why are we debating this motion? The last two years, this country and all around the world, we had to address this tragedy of the pandemic of COVID-19. So, let me remind you, that most, not exactly two years ago, but about 20 months ago, when the first signs of that COVID pandemic rise up around the world, we were very cautious. Everybody looking at that, we were not quite sure what, what we address it. And in March, when everything happened here in this country, we have seen, Madam Speaker, and I want to pay all my respect to all those civil servants who, did, who work tirelessly and many times 24 hours a day to assure that, yes, we can have a hybrid parliament. Why, Madam Speaker? Because at that time, it was a real tragedy. It was a real strong pandemic situation here in Canada from coast to coast and all around the world. So, yes, in a, in a very excessive situation, we need real, true solutions. Et c'est pourquoi, Madam la Présidente... And that's why, Madam Speaker, all parties put their shoulder to the wheel and worked shoulder to shoulder to create this hybrid parliament. And allow me, as I did in English a few minutes ago, allow me to thank those who did the outstanding work, the staff of the House of Commons, who in just a few days or weeks managed to create a virtual parliament enabling Canadian parliamentary democracy to continue to operate despite the very difficult situation we were in. And I'd like to commend the person who played that role in our caucus. I can't give his name, unfortunately, but I'm very proud. And I was very humble to succeed that person. But uh, they worked very hard, along with other people, to respond to the crisis of the pandemic by creating a virtual parliament. It was an absolute necessity. So everyone was able to work together. But unfortunately, Madam Speaker, I have to say that there are about 11 months ago in January when Parliament resumed, the government decided, unfortunately, to politicize woefully the House of Commons and to decided to give everyone a lecture. And I'll be very honest and very sincere here. Only one government member was here, the member for Kingston and the Islands, and I'd like to salute him. He was a, a perpetual presence, if you will, asserting the government's authority in this place. And I asked him, why is it always you? Uh, I'd like to ask him, why was it always you? And I'll let him answer the question. It's no secret who I'm talking about. To the colleague from Kingston to Allen, who serve in this house as a sole and only soldier of the Liberal Government Party here in the House of Commons. This is a personal achievement, but this is also, Madam Speaker, a shameful achievement of this government. Why, Madam Speaker? Because, yes, we have seen some people who attend the House, we have seen one member who attend the House on a daily basis. But all of those, all the others, spend their time in their writing, spend their time in their house, and also spend their time in their department's office, which was not far away from this house. Et c'est pourquoi, Madame la Présidente? And that's why, Madam Speaker, I insist on severely reprimanding the government's attitude during the first six months of 2021. Because, yes, Madam Speaker, we saw members and ministers doing their job following the rule to the letter, following the rules scrupulously, uh, the, the orders given by the prime minister, which were to stay home or stay in your office, your writing office or your minister's office, do not leave your office or your home, period. Madam Speaker. There. Madam Speaker, yesterday the House saw a very rare but very important moment. The House found the Public Health Agency guilty to British Columbians. 
I can only imagine the hardship that you and your families have been facing and will be continuing to face in rebuilding efforts. Although roads and railways may have felt that you were cut off from Canada, please know that you will never be cut off from your friends and family in this great country. Our country as a whole is here to support you because that is what it means to be Canadian. In times of trouble, we all come together. When people need help, we are there to serve. From the lower mainland to the interior, when the highways turn to rivers, that's when we saw British Columbians step up with heroic action for their neighbours. People like Henry Chilihitsia, who used a motorboat to lead 29 horses to safety near near-freezing and fast-moving moving floodwaters in Merritt. A helicopter pilot from Vancouver Island, Mr. Speaker, sprung into action delivering badly needed supplies in the mainland before rescuing six people who were stuck in hope. Cities like Kamloops and Kelowna have opened their doors to welcome hundreds if not thousands stranded in British Columbia. Communities have stepped up with heroic resilience, resilience that Canadians have been known for at home and around the world. But it's time that those families know that the rest of Canada is stepping up too. The work of our Canadian Armed Forces, of our first responders on the ground, civic workers, have saved lives and protected property. But the rebuilding effort will require significant federal support and a long-term plan and commitment. British Columbians need to know that Canada will be with you for the long term as you rebuild. You need, we're here. You need a united country behind you to help you get back on your feet. And my commitment to you is the Conservatives here in Ottawa will be a voice for you now and in every day forward as we rebuild. We will ensure that no one is left behind and you will get the support you need. Mr. Speaker, we know that one aspect of climate change is more frequent extreme weather. While we must work to lower emissions, we must also work to protect our communities and protect our economy by building resilient communities and dedicating specific infrastructure funding to adaptation efforts. We campaigned on a plan to better prepare communities for the impacts of a changing climate. I spoke to Mayor Henry Braun in Abbotsford a few days ago. I want to thank Mayor Braun and civic leaders like him across BC for their leadership in this time of crisis. <laughs> Mayor Braun has told me, as other mayors have told my colleagues, about dikes that need rebuilding in Abbotsford, Agassiz and Hope in Kent. These communities need to know that there is a long-term commitment to resilient infrastructure. Conservatives promised to develop and implement a national action plan on floods, including a residential high-risk flood insurance program so that Canadians can rebuild. Our plan also included developing a national climate adaptation strategy incorporating directly mitigation and adaptation lenses to all infrastructure projects. And we ran and committed on appointing a National Disaster Resilience Advisor to the Privy Council Office so that expertise is just down the hall from the Prime Minister whenever emergencies happen. And for a government that is known for lots of talk and little action, I welcome them to steal any of our ideas as we need to rebuild British Columbia, Mr. Speaker. We will advocate for these important measures. Conservatives will be watching to make sure the government takes concrete action to protect the lives and livelihoods of Canadians. Let's work together to protect our country. Grâce aux investissements du gouvernement Thanks to the precedent conservative government's investment in the military, our men and women in uniform are able to deploy many troops, supplies and equipment. Minister of Public Safety, 
for working with Conservative MPs and all MPs in our federal response. I respect that, Mr. Speaker. But the Liberal government also needs to be crystal clear when it comes to promises they make to Canadians who are in crisis and are worried. This past weekend, the Liberal minister was telling BC residents that they could cross the US border to buy essential supplies without needing a COVID-19 test. But now we're hearing reports that flood-affected Canadians were fined over $5,000 for not taking the test before they returned home. British Columbians cannot afford this type of confusion, and I sincerely hope that the minister moves to correct this situation. Mr. Speaker, I'm incredibly proud of my colleagues in this House from British Columbia who have been actively supporting their constituents and partner levels of government. The member for Abbotsford, Mission Masque Fraser Canyon, and all of our MPs, including the MP for Chilliwack Hope, who's remained on the ground helping coordinate efforts with our members here in Ottawa. Our entire BC team is here tonight and is working day and night to help those displaced and impacted. And as I said, Mr. Speaker, I know that this is not just our side of the House. Indeed, all Canadians and all British Columbians need to know that we will be working for them. So everyone here in this emergency debate this evening, I thank you for standing up for your fellow Canadians. We're here, Mr. Speaker. Let us be united in helping those who need it most. Let us make sure we protect people now and have long-term commitments to rebuild for the economic rebuilding that will be required. Let's combat and get emissions down while also making sure we have adaptation efforts that are underway with dikes, with flood mitigation, and with emergency preparedness, Mr. Speaker. Issues such as this should not be political. We need to make sure that the Prime Minister and Privy Council Office has the ability to rapidly address the needs of the nation, addressing the use of the Canadian Armed Forces, including with more direct Army engineering capacity on the ground in British Columbia, something that's really been deprived for the province since a Liberal government in the past closed CFB Chilliwack, Mr. Speaker. So let's make sure we build that capacity, we work together, and we send a clear message to British Columbians tonight. We're here with you today, tomorrow, and to the last day of the rebuilding because we need a strong British Columbia for a strong Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.